Welcome to EIS Core Talk. Yes, the answer to the question, what would happen if you ordered David Brent on Wish and asked him to host an InsureTech chat show? <laughs> this, literally this. And today's theme, you're buying insurance software wrong and what you can do about it. Honestly, we've not seen this many bad buying decisions since we let Tony pick his own wardrobe for season one. <laughs> Crocs. And we'll be deep diving the RFX process, the role of procurement, and what the ideal customer journey looks like with our expert panel of guests today. And there'll be no fence sitting. No, you get splinters off that. Ooh, uncomfortable. And we're not just gonna be telling you what the problems are. No, no, no. We're gonna be delivering more fixes than a North Korean election. Yeah? I can do political, it's like Ben Elton. Yeah, so high, brow, you'd think I had Botox. Anyway, run the VT. Well, 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 here we are at season two of EIS Core Talk. Yeah, somebody got drunk enough at the EIS marketing meeting and thought, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's, let's recommission this for another series. <laughs> I don't want to tell tales. I don't want a situation, but Tony has been spending an awful lot of time with Mikey Mike recently. Yeah. Anyway, if you're one of our six avid viewers, Alexi, mum, do you know my mum? actually told me she doesn't watch this show. All the effort that goes into it and my own mum doesn't watch it, which I think is pretty brave given I'll be picking what home she goes into in a few years and I have my eye on a very nice little hot tub. Be warned mum. Anyway, <laughs> some changes around here. You'll notice some of the bright lights have gone, yeah? And the shiny surfaces and with that unfortunately the dusting team went. Sorry Dean, but it was that or we investigated the HR complaint. <laughs> but the copiers are not meant to be used like that. Anyway, there are some changes and one of the things you also might have noticed was there was a little bit more funk in the trunk. Can we... Can we trademark that? <laughs> Good, yep. Yeah. Funk in the trunk in the theme tune as we came in and that's because, I'll be honest, things are about to get pretty super sexy up in here. Pony. We've managed to get ourselves a house band Raspberry Pi! You're so cute You're so Nouveau niche Can you manage my enterprise Or Just one piece Oh Can you adapt to my vision Can you Change and adapt Is there a tech thing? What a lovely little ditty. That was, Tony loves the ditties. <laughs> anyway, I kid you not, if you go over to raspberrypieinthesky.com, not only can you find out a little bit more about our famous house band, who, I mean, this is their big break. I think they all appreciate that. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, you can buy, I kid you not, their super sexy calendar for 2022. $5? I mean, it's nearly the end of the year now, but <laughs> but if you want pictures of, of those guys in their swimwear, just being lapped at by the Atlantic Ocean, this is your slightly niche opportunity to do that. But anyway, guys, when's the 2023 calendar coming out? When we take the pictures. Good. Anyway, glad I asked. Now, if you're thinking, 
and I'm sure you all are, oh, why do you need a house burned for an insured tech chat show? <laughs> Funny true story on that. I suggested it to Tony in a creative meeting, joking. He hasn't quite worked out British sarcasm yet, and here we are. Awkward, sorry guys. <laughs> anyway, we had lots of great entertainment come out of here in San Francisco, including the Maltese Falcon, yeah, Escape from Alcatraz, Dirty Harry, and my guest today remind me of a few of the others, so let's get them out, shall we? He's a man of steel, bespectacled, and with a laser eye for strategy, which is handy because he's head of strategy at EIS. It is the Superman of software, it's Rory Yates. Oh, that kryptonite prop from series one seems a little bit insensitive somehow now. <laughs> anyway, in her pursuit of happiness, she joins CGI as director of consulting services. She has bedazzled us on Vendor Spotlight with her basic instinct, don't make the joke, do not make the joke, for technology. Now, she joins us to make a full house. <laughs> it's Kate Cordell. <laughs> and my co-host is a man I always think of when I watch this film because they can both make you raise a smile, they can both make you cry, they got great accents, they like a bit of fancy dress, yeah. It's Mrs. Doubtfire and it's Tony Grosso. And do you ever uh, wish you could sometimes just freeze frame a moment in your day and then look back at it and say, this is not my career. This is that moment, Ed. <laughs> huh. That's actually a quote from the movie. Well done. Genuinely impressed. Anyway, quick question. What's with the sunglasses? Because we're indoors and you're noticeably not P. Diddy at the Grammys. <laughs> oh, Ed, I got a big surprise for you. It's season two and we've got sponsorships this year. So I met these uh, amazing ladies, uh, Lindsay Strong and Margot Giles at uh, InsureTech Insights New York a few months ago. And they got a company called Go Giles and uh, they are core tech lovers. And you know what? They are. They love super sexy APIs, and they're sponsoring with these shades. Uh, and it's Go Giles, show me your APIs. Show me your super sexy APIs. And it's Go Giles, amazing company. You mean to tell me we're now shilling $1.28 sunglasses on this show? We get 20,000 views and episodes, Tony. I don't think we need this. Second question, second point, probably more important, where's my share? Because I don't remember my name being on the contract and image rights, yeah? <laughs> yeah, you may well look sheepish. We'll talk about this after the show anyway. Image rights. Outrageous. I'm going to crack straight on with the questions and we're going to go in with a really controversial one. And I'm going to pose it to you, Kate. So RFIs, are they actually meaningful, useful and the like? Or are they just a covering your ass exercise? Um, I think RFIs could well be considered as free consultancy, to be quite honest, Ed. I'm not sure it's a covering your ass exercise, but I think it's finding about information about the industry and tech available for free. Oh, no splinters on Kate at all. Excellent. Tony, what about you? Ed, you know, uh, 12,000 line uh, questions in, in an RFI. I mean, what are you going to do with 12,000 questions? I and mean, we've got... 12,000 APIs, that's all that matters. They've got a question for every API that we have. Uh, it's, I don't see the purpose. Who's going to go through that, all of those questions and answers? To be fair, the last time I saw 12,000 questions on a bit of paper, it was when we submitted our first script for Core Talk to EIS's legal team. So, uh, not surprised. Anyway, Rory, what do you think? Well, I feel like you're covering your ass exercise, to be honest with you. Um... They tend to focus wholly on what's happening in a business today and don't, and don't provide much sense of what might be happening in the future. Uh, and I, for one, am sort of fed up with receiving 270 page you know, documents with questions about today. And I got to the point where in one, on one occasion, I, uh, I tore up an RFP in front of the, the client and told them it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Now, Rory, I've seen most RFIs and how 
thick they are. And Superman or not, I'm not entirely convinced you can tear one in half. So I'm, I'm doubting the story a little bit. So to prove the point, we're gonna have a game show. And we're gonna call it, Can Rory Yates Rip a Massive Pile of Paper in Two? It's a working title. Anyway, if you have a little look under your chair there, you'll find a big lump of paper. So, the aim of the game is pretty novel. Can you rip that in half or not? Oh, it looks just like, a, just like an RFP. The answer's no. I'm going to need a gimmick or to pretend that the RFP is only said big. I mean, that was disappointing largely. Can you at least do like half of it, a little bit? Something so that we can have some kind of win. Let's do, let's do one to make sure I can do it. Oh, he's so <laughs> masculine. Anyway, I think it's safe to say that's not going to get commissioned. We tried. It's no worse than in for a penny though. That's on ITV. Yeah. I'd, let's, let's, let's have some meetings. Let's see what we can do. Anyway, on my question two. So, I've always worked on the basis that if I don't know about an RFI before it hits my desk, that I am completely wasting my time. Kate, is that is that fair? Is that what re is that really the case? Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily whether you think you're going to win it or not. I think it's being aware of it. If an RFI lands on your desk, no notice, and most importantly, you're only given two weeks to answer, I think you can safely assume that you're in it to make up the numbers. Rory, what's your experience of it? I think it is fair. Uh, I think that most of the decisions have been taken in the, in the run up to the receiving of that document. The 700 pages of, of questions about what you've done in the past or what you're doing today uh, and how it might be cheaper. I think the, uh, the thing that you can do to turn that around is you, you end up really challenging the process around the true strategy or true intentions of the business and see where you can get. But you're fighting against a, an already established relationship in, in most of the time. Now, I remember once filling in a small thesis when I was selling software at about three days notice. Stop doing that! <laughs> and the insurance broker in question had got me up at three o'clock in the morning and I'd driven to the other side of the country to get there in time for a nine o'clock meeting that absolutely couldn't be changed. It had to be there and then. Um, and when I sat down and they asked me the first question, two, two things became really obvious really, really quickly. And that was firstly, we weren't a good match. We were not what they were looking for. Secondly, they also would have realised that if they'd read even page one of the <laughs> RFX. Is, is the problem that the RFI, RFX, RFP process doesn't even actually work for the people who are doing it? I think there needs to be a process. I feel really strongly that there needs to be a process, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all about the blue brain and lists and spreadsheets and ticking things off. I think there needs to be a business, um, there needs to be a process for a number of reasons, supporting the business, supporting the individuals making the decision, and actually for the tech providers involved that they can feel really confident it has been as fair a process as possible. Um, we've all answered RFPs, you know, we all know the effort, energy, sleepless nights that go into responding to them. You want to feel that um, you know, you've, you've had a fairer chance as, as anyone. Um, however, the process I think works when you're buying things, printers, rings of paper. Um, I don't think necessarily works when you're buying technology. Technology is about, at the moment, it's about providing future vision, about helping you achieve your ambitions, your strategies. And I'm not sure, actually no, I am sure, I'm sure that the process doesn't work for anyone at the moment. Um, could procurement do with more support from the business? Possibly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not fundamentally broken, but I think it's broken and needs some, needs some fixing somewhere. Rory, what do you reckon? I think that's right. I think sometimes you end up in these, these horrible systems where your response is constrained. You can't really challenge the question in any way. It doesn't then bring out the best response from you as a vendor, your experience. And we had uh, a customer recently say something which I thought possessed quite a lot of wisdom, which was, um, you, you do this 10 times a year. We, we do this once every five years. And in that space, you'd expect some freedom to respond differently, challenge the process, have alternative conversations, but probably not fill in answers, probably show how you can make a, a successful insurance business really operate today. So one of the questions that came out before this episode in the uh, the green room uh, was about where the RFX process falls down. Does it fall down uh, within procurement or does it fall down with the wider businesses input into that process? 
Yeah, I think I think as well how how you answer them as well. The dreaded spreadsheet, the dreaded spreadsheet of Tony's two hundred questions that you answer, and you know, are you compliant? Yes or no, and then you give your reasons for it, and then you know that gets divvied up in the business. It's an answer. You know, you're you're scored by different people for different bits. I think it's just really inelegant. I just don't. I just don't think it works very well for for what we're trying to achieve at the moment in the market. Roy, what do you think? I think it's both, Ed. I think um, I think the engagement between the business and procurement doesn't necessarily always work. If you just ask somebody for their requirements, they can only really respond with what they know, and what they know is how they operate today. Um, and it tends to be the case that the the vision or the strategy of the business that sits at board level isn't necessarily fully democratised across the business anyway. So I think a lot gets lost between the the two, to be honest. Tony? You know, it, it's really interesting. I mean, it's an awesome question. And it's, uh, I'd, we've done about 50, responded to about 50 over the past couple of years in both North America and uh, UK. And what I found is, I'll say about 70%, 60 to 70% are really just replicating what they have today. It's just 12,000 lines of functions of insurance as it was 10 years ago, and they just wanted, you know, that same thing, just a newer technology with a few new bells and whistles, but it's not transformation. Now, geographically, what I found in between North America and the UK, I mean, I've truly been inspired with the RFIs that I've been seeing in the UK, uh, like Eshore and Aegeus. Uh, they had, uh, they had such uh, visions of where they wanted to go in the market. And and we were filling it out. I mean, I got excited about it. I was like, I want to work there. Well, uh, no, no, uh, Alex Miloslavsky, I don't want to work there. But if I was uh, in the market for a job, I'd be like, I want to work there because it was really inspiring where they want to go. So it's about 60, 70 percent is is about yesterday. And then there there is a difference between the, the geographies. And what's the biggest bump in the road to avoid during the buying process if you don't want to get off-roaded, Kate? Biggest bump in the road. Um, I think that they need to talk to the market before they're in a position to start RFI, RFP process. I think that they need to be kind of sharing their vision, sharing their ambition. You know, Tony's just mentioned it, but, you know, really, really sharing their strategy, where they want to be in in two, five, ten years' time. And then asking providers how they'd meet that strategy. I think a number of times, you know, I see clients telling me what they think they need or want, but actually once they've shared what it is they're looking to achieve, the answer looks really, really different. I think that telling tech providers what they want to be doing, um, I, I think could really, really drive some very different positive results for the industry. And actually those tech providers know what their technology does. Roy, what do you think? The future is really tough. I mean, you asked me about my future in my personal context, and I'll find that difficult to respond to. And I completely get that. And I think there are massive merits in huge parts of the procurement process. Um, in particular, the bit where they ask you, well, how do you align with my strategy or what I'm trying to achieve? I think sometimes, though, when we, we start talking about rigid functionality or a particular way of operating in a particular context, that's far too constraining. And what we'd much rather do is put the context of change and how the business and the IT functions are going to work together uh, and put that into a real lived experience. You know, something like a POC or a, or even delivering part of an MVP would be completely pr appropriate use of the, that process. So I think it's marrying these two things together. That's, the re that's going to create the real answers to these problems. And for you, Tony? I think the biggest bump of the road is, is what they need to start doing is these functional bake-offs. It's, these are the, those rapid fire 300 functional demos in four hours. I mean, really, what is anybody going to get out of watching somebody perform 300 different functions for a second and a half each? It's not really buying you anything. And it's kind of like what Kate was talking about earlier. It's just a check the box function that, okay, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, but it's not taking you to your future. And that's going to be the biggest bump in the road if they're evaluating what they're going to purchase based off of some rapid fire demo of, of a second and a half of each function. Now, this is all very well from the seller's perspective, but you know, what about the buyers? What does their ideal journey look like? Because I get the impression from a lot having spoken to them that they don't actually really know where to start even. 
Um, and there are a huge number of options out there, Ed. You know, there's some really, really phenomenal tech providers out there at the moment. Um, so how do they do it well? I think they need to talk to people. They need to talk to people well before they're in a position to start the RFI, RFP process. They need to talk to tech providers about what their tech does, what their thoughts are on, on the direction of the market and what their competition's doing. Um, I think they also need to recognise, and it's, it's not the answer that I think people want to hear, but I think they need to recognise there isn't a one-size-fits-all or at least one-size-works-for-all. I don't think there's technology out there that does it all or at least does it all well. Um, I think there's going to be a need for you know working with 10, 12, 15 um, tech providers, you know, an underlying platform that then APIs, and I know Tony loves an API, you know, there, there, there's going to be a need to API into providers that do what you're looking to do phenomenally well. Um, how you integrate that is, you know, it's another question. Implementation is expensive, it's scary, there's a need to do it well and do it properly. If implementation fails and the whole program fails, um, so I don't, I don't think there's a quick answer. I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think it's all about communication, relationships, um, working with people and understanding what's out there and how it, can, how it can help you achieve what it is you're looking to do over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Rory? I think it's nearly always when somebody says, but that doesn't look exactly like we, we operated today. And actually, you know, put it, put, convey that point of view in a way that means they really do want to work like they do today. Which begs the question: Why? Why are we being procured in the first place? Uh, and that always derails you because it's a very difficult one to respond to. Um, and again, you have to put everything in the context of the future. This opaque, hard to understand future. Um, but you know, these challenges are going to come in any process. So I think part of me, you know, expects them now. Now, obviously, uh, we've always done it that way. Send shivers down the spine of every technology salesperson, particularly in insurance, <laughs> ever. It's the worst thing you can ever hear. But what other phrases um, tip you off that the wheels are about to come off big time? Um, it is about to go down when they've given you just two weeks to respond. How do you give a proper response that's well thought out, well considered, involves your whole business as an honest answer rather than just a copy and paste from the last RFP. You can't do that in 10 days. Please give us longer. Um, my personal pet hate is when you're slightly further along the, the, the process, you know, you're in, you're in commercial discussions possibly um, and it's best and final offer. I think that it just shows it is all about, um, you know, the, the bottom line is not about the value that you're bringing to the organisation, potential cash saving, time saving, um, return on investment. It is, it is just about hammering you down to the lowest price. I don't think that serves anyone well because all it means in the future is any change they want is going to come to, come to cost. Um, yeah, best and final offer, definitely. What about you, Rory? I mean, sticking with the process is, is pretty fundamental um, and it's very hard to, to get off that road once you're on it. Um, and we have tried and we do meet some resistance. And on the odd occasion, you can find a, a different path, a more strategic path. I think what you have to do is try and find the balance between challenging that strategic future in which you know the business really wants to exist um, and bring that customer along with you along that process. Um, and that's just about making the most of every moment. And we do an awful lot of strategic alignment. It's challenging. Um, and sometimes it feels like you are agent provocateur and you see some funny expressions on faces when really they only wanted you to answer set questions. Um, but I think it's important not to be too combative, follow that process, but challenge where, where it's necessary. Ideally, though, we change the process altogether. And sometimes we're lucky enough to convince a client to go a different route, do an MVP with us experiment with something think about you know how can we put theater around that idea of change um but, but ultimately you've got to work with the process and tony for you uh the one that really uh, gets me and it happens every single time it's uh we got to be a market asap uh we're wasting no time this is the most important project can you meet those uh timelines we're moving them up sure we can and then what happens, and it happens every single time, the procurement process then takes three times longer than the original plan, but they still don't move that date. Uh, but the procurement process, a lot of time is wasted. Uh, that's the one that sends shivers up my spine because it never comes back to look at that date again. 
with you, Tony. I tend to know the wheels are about to come off when you ask, shall we give Mikey Mike a call and see if he's around for a quick one? <laughs> Now this is the bit that everyone's been waiting for, and if they haven't, sod them. <laughs> but what I want to know is what should the buying process look like to maximise the chances of making the right decision? So I know what Tony's answer is going to be. Tony's answer is going to be just talk to one provider, ideally AIS, and uh, and and work with work with them from the beginning. Um, in a more serious note, how do they make it work? I think they they make it work through talking to people. You know, Tony mentioned it earlier, talk to the industry, what's working for people um, or, or what's working for other people that you can, you know, learn from, adopt, talk to tech providers, they know what their technology does, they know what it's going to be doing in the future, they speak to insurers, they know the direction of travel of the industry. Um, so yeah, I think it's communication, talk to people, learn from people, um, tell them what it is you're looking to achieve, not what it is you think you need, and just be really open about you know, your timelines, your budget, um, who's going to be involved and how long you want it to take. What do you think, Tony? Well, at first, I cannot, uh, I cannot improve on Kate's answer. That was absolutely spot on. Um, so, the, so let me just talk about the best uh, buying experience that I've ever experienced. And it was with a, a, an amazing insurer in the United States. I, uh, and their whole thing was, we're building, you know, we're, we want to build uh, technology for insurance of 2030, not next year or the year after. And so they had uh, five or six different uh, theories of what insurance in their world in the year 2030 will look like. And what they said was pick two of these scenarios, build it into your system, and then let's walk through it. And what that did was they're able to now see and envision what their future could look like because they don't know the technology and so they can't build it themselves. They don't know yet what the technology can do. They only know what their current systems can do because they've worked there pretty much their entire career. And so what it allowed them to do is really get their hands on um, at least the supplier's view of what that future looks like. So they can now start to experience things that they didn't know existed. They can now start to work with the supplier to make changes because they now know what it can do or can't do. It's like, oh, you know, you had a really good idea, but we were thinking it was more like this. So it's a, an immersive buying experience rather than something that you're evaluating on paper or just watching somebody else click through rapid fire demos. That is the ultimate buying experience. I've never experienced it again out of all the 50 or so that we've been through, but I will always remember that uh, it was good for both sides of, of the table. Rory? Ideally for me, you know, a really strong sense of that strategy, that future vision, um, perhaps respond in the context of how would you deliver this or how would it be ideally delivered using your uh, capability, then put the, the process in that into context, you know, let's do some stuff together or let's imagine some scenarios, future facing ones, ones in which we change or we experiment with the future in the way that we intend to. Um, and then I think probably at the end, start to really grapple with, you know, the enterprise design elements. That's the moment where for us, we tend to work with our partners and get really, you know, down into the weeds of how do you actually make this a real lived transformation? Um, but it's that fusion of those three sort of processes in, into one, I think would be ideal. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. I mean, it isn't. We could literally go on as long as we wanted to, but I'm bored at this point. Yeah, the HD's kicked in. I'm sure you are. Don't want to push our luck. Anyway, if you enjoyed it, and if you are one of the weirdos who wants more of it, please visit <laughs> eixgroup.com slash portal. You can not only re-watch this episode, yeah, you can just loop it, watch it all day, but you can actually like, share, comment, all those things. You can also see the last series, and the last series was really rather spectacular as well. So you can watch that, and that gives you a fighting chance of actually getting all the little in-jokes that we make, and you'll find out, for example, who Mikey Mike is. And you'll find out about why Samantha Chow is so big in Moldova. Anyway, if you didn't, now you know how to buy software for your insurance business more effectively. Our collective thanks go to Tony, Kate and Rory for tipping us off or over the edge in Tony's case. Anyway, we will be back next month with episode two. But until then, we will see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.